Well, thank you all for staying, and I know it's been a sort of long meeting for those people who've been here from the beginning, although it's been a great meeting for geriatrics. I think we've had really, really great sessions. I'm sorry that this one is the last of our sessions because I think it's one of the, the most important. So we know as our patients get older, we see more and more of them with cognitive impairment and uh, dementia, and I think I'm correct in saying that the vast majority of our surgical residents and uh, trainees uh, and, f and um, attendings have no training in how to diagnose cognitive impairment or what to do once they do uh, diagnose it and what the impact is on the care of the patients. And so this, I think, is a sort of really Im important session. And our friends at AARP tell us that the one thing that matters most to their members is their cogn maintaining their cognitive ability. So as we think about what matters, I think this is really a sort of uh, very important stuff. So I just want to give you a tiny bit of um, background about uh, this particular session. Now, let me open this. I added these slides at, you know, 7.30 this morning, so. But, um, so the Council of Medical um, uh, Specialty Societies, the CMSS, got a grant from the um, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to improve um, diagnostic excellence across all of medicine. And the ACS was one of 11 organizations last year that got the grant to look at diagnostic excellence in dementia and cognitive impairment in the surgical setting. So this is a is sort of a supported uh, effort. And the goal was to de develop and disseminate um, educational resources focused on diagnostic excellence in dementia and cognitive impairment in adults undergoing surgery. And so there, there were... Um, there were five actual deliverables, and today is like us delivering the first of these deliverables, which is to have a session at the, con at the clinical congress, at the, not congress, at the quality and safety meeting that actually um, d addresses this subject. Next year, we're gonna try to put this early in the meeting so that um, people can actually hear it. But the other deliverables are a, um, a webinar about cognitive impairment screening, and Kat, that's already up, the webinar? Yep. Great, 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 great. And um, we've developed a patient and caregiver brochure um, that sort of uh, addresses um, what the issues of cognitive impairment and dementia are for patients. And there'll be a column in the bulletin in September, um, uh, the September College Bulletin. And um, finally, they we're working on a best practice uh, toolkit that will be available on the, on the website. So I think there's... Um, really good stuff happening in um, this area. So let's start this uh, morning's presentation with um, Julia Berrien. Now, Julia uh, is, um, you ready? <laughs> Julia is well known to many of us. Julia is an assistant professor of surgery in the division of colorectal at the University of Wisconsin. Her work focuses on, impair, um, on improving a surgical care of older adults. Julia got her NIAK award, first time trying, which is fantastic, um, which looks at focus, which focuses on the application of systems engineering and implementation scientists, uh, sciences to geriatric assessments. So, Julia, are you ready? <laughs> I think you're set up there. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, okay, great. That's all right. Mine is short and sweet. So, um, uh, so thank you everyone for coming um, in the morning on the last day. Um, so I'm going to be talking about screening in the preoperative setting. Um, my disclosures are uh, simply related to my grant support. And <clears throat> I suppose, you know, we talk a lot about why this is important, and of course I will touch on that. Um, but the truth is that, you know, there's a lot more to it, so I'll try to go in a little more depth about, you know, who to screen, what's involved, how to choose your instruments, um, et cetera. So, um, oh, formatting issues, sorry. Um, so, you know, why screen? Ultimately, we know that older adults are at high risk for postoperative delirium or longer term cognitive decline, which collectively are, are called perioperative neurocognitive disorders or PNDs. That's kind of 
newer terminology. Um, we will be talking about this at length uh, throughout the session, so I will not be going into detail about this, but it's important to be aware that screening can help us identify those who are at highest risk um, for postoperative delirium or PNDs. Um, it can help us counsel patients better and educate their families better. And this ultimately leads to a better experience for them, even if they do develop a syndrome like postoperative delirium. And then hopefully we are able to prevent those episodes of postoperative delirium by identifying the highest risk patients. And then finally, the last point, which makes me very sad that it uh, had formatting issues because I think it's really important, um, is the idea that we can connect patients and families with resources and really leverage the surgical episode to provide them better longer term care. For example, plugging them into something like a memory care clinic. So, um, you know, who should I screen? <laughs> so if you have a brain, you're at risk for dementia. Um, I do not recall who I heard say this um, because I've listened to many various podcasts on dementia. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you know, CMS is changing and recommending more screening for cognition uh, as part of their annual wellness exams. Um, you could say that that's not feasible. We only want to re screen the highest risk population. So you could potentially start with the oldest old, um, uh, you know, 85 plus. You could start with those who have some clinical de degree of concern. Um, I would say whatever is feasible in your system is the important place to start. Uh, we say this a lot, um, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, I put CMS up here as well as the American Academy of Neurology, who also does recommend uh, screening for uh, cognition, for cognitive impairment in older adults. So, you know, let's assume that you're really just going to try to screen everybody, 65 up, who is having a major operation. So what exactly is cognitive screening? Well, I think it's important to say what it is not. This is not a diagnosis of dementia or mild cognitive impairment. It is simply screening for risk. So a diagnosis of dementia really requires memory impairment with interference of functioning and often requires multiple assessments showing that over time. This graph is a schematic of cognitive function and change over time. And if you see, say, the green line being someone who has no cognitive impairment issues, that person will have some decline over time. The person who has the red line may be someone who is in the process of de developing dementia. And there is often some insult that will change their trajectory. So the point of doing these screens is that you don't want your surgical episode and that postoperative delirium episode to be the thing that knocks someone off course. So now let's talk about the content of screening. And before we talk about the content of screening, I think it's really interesting just to have a quick review of what are the cognitive domains, because the truth is that I don't really live in this world. Most of us don't really live in this world. And cognition can be very confusing. So these are some of the most commonly tested domains of cognition, and they're actually quite different. So language, that's pretty obvious, right? Naming, reading, writing, repeating words, um, basically, there are many tests that use language as a uh, component of their cognitive assessments. Um, and then I also wanted to point out that expressive aphasias or inability to find words can be impaired with normal aging. So, you know, makes all of us, myself included, feel better. <laughs> executive function. Does anybody recognize this gentleman? He's the most famous example of executive function. Uh, so executive function is organi organizing, planning, reasoning, problem solving, executing tasks. This gentleman is Phineas Gage. So in 1848, he had a tamping iron explode and it was driven through his left cheek into the vault of his skull and went straight through his um, frontal lobe 
And what's more remarkable than the fact that he survived was that there was a physician able to do cognitive testing on him and document what changed in his cognition. So this top line, he remembers passing and past events correctly as well before as since the injury. So his memory as the domain of memory, that was actually all intact. Everything that was disrupted was related to his executive function. So you can see here, he was capricious and childish and obstinate. He was fitful, irreverent, indulgent. His mind was radically changed but he didn't really have memory impairment. <laughs> um, abstract reasoning, uh, this is analyzing information, detecting patterns or relationships, um, solving intangible or theoretical problems. So if you look at these two pictures, it requires some degree of abstract reasoning to say what is the similarity between a plane and a bicycle to be able to realize there are two forms of transportation, interpreting context and societal um, functions. So then that leads us to memory, the last and um, often tested domain. So there are a lot of subdomains within memory, short-term, long-term memory, we use those terms all the time. Um, procedural memory is kind of obviously related to the steps that all go together to create a procedure. Uh, declarative memory being more facts episodic memory being the context and all of the details surrounding an episode, um, and then semantic memory being related to knowledge base or what we build in our professions. Okay, so now that we've done that, um, how to choose your screener? So it's helpful to kind of think about those domains when you start looking at different screening instruments because you'll start finding patterns of, oh, I see that this one is more testing attention, this one is testing you know, executive function, et cetera. So uh, thinking about the domains and then thinking about sensitivity and specificity for a given outcome. Finally, feasibility, as I've said before, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. You really need to know how much time it takes to administer and how easy it is to administer. So as an example, the mini mental state exam status examination is widely used, um, but it is quite time consuming and it really was developed for dementia. So it doesn't have great sensitivity for mild cognitive impairment. And that really is what we would want to be testing for in surgical patients who otherwise um, uh, are coming to us for operations. So perhaps don't use that. I reviewed a number of, um, of the literature, you know, the number of papers in preparing for this, and I found that this was a quite helpful review. Um, you know, screening for mild cognitive impairment in preoperative setting, this is a narrative review. But they were very specific about what was their inclusion and exclusion criteria. So, you know, they uh, ver were very specific about using screeners that covered the domain of memory. Because, and they made the argument, you know, amnestic mild cognitive impairment is the most common subtype that will progress to something like Alzheimer's disease or other related dementias. And so they specifically were, were searching for screeners that used memory as a component. Uh, that took 15 minutes or less of administration time, which I've called shorter, that, shorter for you. <laughs> um, and then the, that were validated against gold standard neuropsychology testing, which I think is another important thing when you're reviewing some of these screeners to figure out exactly how were they validated. And then finally, they wanted to find screeners that actually had evidence documenting their sensitivity and specificity for mild cognitive impairment and particularly for the elderly surgical population, although not all had that population. So here are uh, four tests that I thought were worth sharing. Uh, the first is the mini-cog, which includes a three-word recall and a clock draw. It takes about three minutes to administer and has about 86 and 79% sensitivity specificity for mild cognitive impairment, respectively. The Ottawa three-day year test is simply the day, the date, world spelled backwards, and then year. It's about two to three minutes. Interestingly, the literature for this one actually combined both dementia and mild cognitive impairment testing, um, but it was that's why it's just cognitive impairment with the asterisk, uh, around 80 and 56% for sensitivity and specificity. 
the St. Louis University Mental Status Exam, the orientation, short-term memory, calculation, naming animals, clock draw, and geometric figures, a little more involved, right? Seven minutes, approximately, and then a range of sensitivity and sens specificity because it has some more papers attached to it um, in terms of the validation. And then finally, the MOCA, which is very commonly used, um, recall, clock draw, trail making, and orientation tests also a little longer, so 10 minutes. We use this in my institution because we have you know, a more dedicated process for these geriatric assessments, um, but you can really tailor which, one, which screener you use to the setting that you're using it in. And then, you know, to, as we kind of close out this review of screening, I wanted to um, make a point that, you know, many of these cognitive screeners are highly biased towards education and English language. And so um, testing performance we know is influenced by social determinants um, and socioeconomic disadvantage tends to be concentrated in racial and ethnic minorities and therefore many of these tests are not really proven or validated in those populations. Um, when examined, you know, obviously there are going to be ranges of uh, diagnoses, and it turns out that that African Americans and Hispanic populations actually do have higher rates of dementia, um, but are are not often being detected. So this is a schematic of pathways linking race and ethnicity uh, to cognitive aging including a number of social determinants, um, as well as individual factors that might influence someone's cognition and their change over time. And when specifically applied to some of these populations, for example, the MOCA, there's the subtests within the MOCA actually failed to discriminate between normal and MCI, or between MCI and dementia within non-Hispanic black and Hispanic populations. So I think, you know, I don't have an easy answer for this, but it's really important to be aware of it um, since, you know, one of the themes running throughout this conference is access and equity. There is uh, this um, Rudis scale, which I have to admit it came from up while we were doing the uh, podcast. So um, a little thank you to Kelly Flood for bringing it to my attention. Um, but this scale was really designed for dementia. Um, and so, you know, would not really be included for looking for mild cognitive impairment. Um, but it is designed to be culturally and linguistically sensitive to different populations and to be adapted into different populations. And it has a six item score with an administration time of less than 10 minutes, so somewhere around six minutes. So I guess I would, um, I would close by saying hopefully this little review is helpful to you um, and you ha should have access to the slides um, and that, you know, really choose your screener wisely, um, but just choose something that works. So thanks guys. Thanks, Julia. That was a, a really great review. And um, Let's go on to Sarah Wingfield. Um, Sarah is um, one of the population of geriatricians who loves to work with surgeons. She's at the uh, University of Texas in Southwestern and she's um, the founder and the director of their POSH program. So, Sarah. Thank you for that introduction. Let's get my slides up. Okay, um, so I'm gonna focus on talking about shared decision-making for patients with various levels of cognitive impairment. And we're gonna talk a little bit about capacity assessment and identifying a surrogate decision-maker, but not just those things. Um, so um, my disclosures, I am a stockholder in the 3M Corporation, but won't be talking about any of their products. Um, so, um, yeah, nope, we're not gonna talk about post-its. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the various levels of cognitive impairment. Like I said, I'm gonna talk about capacity assessment, identification of a surrogate decision maker, and then we're gonna talk about decision making in older adults with cognitive impairment. Um, so uh, Dr. Barian just gave a great review, you know, um, and just to kind of remind everybody, mild cognitive impairment, MCI, um, we're talking about the patient has cognitive impairment, but minimal impairment in their ability to complete um, instrumental activities of daily living. Um, 
And these patients can progress to have dementia um, over time. Uh, the cumulative incidence in de of dementia in patients with mild cognitive impairment over 65 who are followed over two years is about 15%. Um, whereas dementia um, is significant cognitive decline in at least one or more of those cognitive domains Dr. Barian was talking about, um, as well as interference in independence um, in activities of daily living, as well as instrumental activities of daily living. So when we're thinking about um, determining capacity to consent, these are kind of the different domains we want to think about. Um, and so, uh, first of all, the patient must be able to express a choice. So they have to be able to understand that, you know, we're, we ha are choosing between two different things. Um, and their decision must be stable enough to imp implement treatment. And so, um, you know, I was taking care of a, a patient on our inpatient service um, who was vacillating back and forth between having um, a thoracentesis performed. Uh, so every time someone would come in to actually do the thoracentesis, they'd be like, no, 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 I don't want it. And then later in the day, they'd say, yes, 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 I do. Um, and so that is a, an issue um, that might suggest that the patient doesn't have capacity if they're vacillating between these things. The patient has to understand the relevant information um, as well as be able to appreciate the situation and its con uh, consequences. So they have to know what their illness is, what the different treatment options are, as well as the consequences of either receiving the treatment or refusing the treatment. Um, and then they have to be able to rationalize or reason through their decision. So be able to weigh the risks and benefits and then make a decision in keeping with their goals. Um, so um, a couple of common issues in determining capacity. Um, we often don't consider the patient's capacity if the patient's agreeing with our recommendations. <laughs> so, you know, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, you have to remember that capacity is decision specific. So, you know, while the patient might not be able to decide whether or not they can have a Whipple, they might be able to decide who their decision maker is um, to help them make that decision. Um, Having cognitive impairment doesn't automatically mean that the patient doesn't have capacity. Um, so you need to make that assessment each time. Um, and in order to determine whether the patient has capacity, they have to be adequately informed. So if you don't know what the previous discussions about the issue has been before they come in, you can't necessarily say they don't have capacity because when I went in, they said they didn't know anything about their surgery. Um, also, the patient must participate in the capacity assessment. So one of the most challenging situations I run into is when the patient just refuses to answer any of your questions. So when you say, please, you know, tell me a little bit about what somebody's told you about risks and benefits, and they're like, I don't need to answer these questions, um, that becomes really difficult to assess whether they have capacity or not. So uh, for surrogate decision making, one thing to note is that um, determining next of kin and things like that is very state specific. So I have the Texas you know, health and safety code up here. Um, but the first surrogate decision maker, usually the patient's proxy, you know, um, le legal medical power of attorney. Um, if they don't have that, it goes to the next of kin. Um, so that could be spouse, adult children, parents. Um, in Texas, they could have an individual who's clearly identified to act for them. Um, in Texas, it also comes down to um, the clergy could decide for you. Um, and then um, the surrogate should use this idea of substituted judgment, which is making the decision that the patient would make if he or she were able. I also wanted to talk a little bit about bias. Um, so uh, there are several studies looking at um, patients with mild cognitive impairment, and it turns out that um, you know they have shown that older adults with mild cognitive impairment actually receive less guideline concordant care for cardiovascular disease. So this was looking at people who had acute MI. Um, the blue is patients with mild cognitive impairment. And so patients with mild cognitive impairment were less likely to receive cardiac catheterization within 30 days. They were less likely to be revascularized within 30 days, and they were less likely to receive cardiac rehabilitation within the next year. Um, however, there's no evidence that patients with MCI actually want less treatment um, than patients with normal cognition. So while they are receiving less treatment, um, it's not clear that that's what they want. Um, so this was one study looking at um, would patients want life-sustaining treatments um, in the setting of different diagnoses. And so the black bars are patients with mild cognitive impairment, and then the, the light gray is patients with normal cognition. Um, and so, you know, it is interesting, I think, to point out that uh, patients with mild cognitive impairment actually would want life-sustaining treatment in the setting of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so several studies um, in the geriatrics world have kind of looked at um, people's treatment preferences um, and how they, they consider quality of life as they go along. And if they develop disability, people tend to adapt to that disability. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting that people who already have cognitive difficulties would still want to receive um, treatment in the setting of dementia.
Uh, this study was looking at the impact of physician decision making in the setting of mild cognitive impairment. Um, so they were interviewing different physicians on um, how they make uh, different decisions about offering treatment or not to patients who had mild cognitive impairment. Um, they were performing semi-structured interviews. Um, and uh, interestingly, these were cardiologists, neurologists, and internal medicine physicians. What they identified was that um, a lot of these physicians were, uh, were not very clear on the difference between mild cognitive impairment and dementia, despite the fact that in the study they did define it before they started asking them questions. Um, and there was a lot of assumptions that patients with mild cognitive impairment are frail with poor functional status, which I know many people in this room know that people with mild cognitive impairment may be frail and have poor functional status, but they also might not. Um, and there was an assumption that MCI is very likely to progress to dementia. And like we talked about, you know, it's about 15% over two years. So not everyone does progress. And some people do improve. So just to point out the different components of capacity that are impacted by cognitive impairment. Um, and actually, patients with mild cognitive impairment um, and uh, patients with mild Alzheimer's disease are able to voice preferences regarding their care. So they're able to do that first step of saying whether they, you know, um, uh, what choice they might make. Um, they're also able to voice a reasonable choice, so meaning things that make sense maybe with their prior goals and values and that kind of thing. Now, um, the components that get more impacted um, as, as people develop more significant cognitive impairment, so appreciating the situation and its consequences. So here you can see about 22% um, percent of these patients um, with uh, mild cognitive, mild Alzheimer's disease, you know, are having that issue. Um, and, but patients with mild cognitive impairment, you still do have a significant percentage that can identify the situation, appreciate the situation and its consequences. Um, and then there's more trouble with reasoning, and more difficulty as well um, with understanding. So you can see that zero of those alt patients with um, mild uh, Alzheimer's disease can kind of um, understand, you know, kind of the situation and its consequences. So kind of getting into a, um, maybe a model of how we can incorporate um, shared decision-making in patients with mild cognitive impairment. Um, so I thought that this uh, kind of um, review was really helpful. Um, and so as you're thinking about, um, you know, we kind of talked about how the patient can re voice preferences, right? They can voice their values. Um, and so when you're assessing values and preferences, the patient should really be the person that you're talking to, you know, um, in this scenario. And they might have their care part partner there, but kind of in the background, right? The care partner's there to sort of support. They're there to hear, you know, what the patient has to say um, so that they can help maybe make decisions for the patient in the future if needed. Then when you're at the point where you're weighing the medical evidence and trying to decide the situation and its consequences, right? We noted that people have more trouble as time goes on and their cognitive impairment worsens, that in this situation, you need to talk to both the patient and the care partner, right? And the care partner can be there to help, um, you know, maybe ask questions and, and things like that. And then when they reach a decision, it's really a shared thing, right? Um, but again, the patient is kind of in the forefront here on this, this, um, this model. So some strategies to improve shared decision-making in patients with mild cognitive impairment, you wanna make sure that you've, you've identified the patient as mild cognitive impairment, not dementia. You wanna make sure that you've clarified the patient's preferences regarding shared decision-making and getting the care partner involved. Um, you do wanna establish continuity of care so that the, you, know, you as a provider can follow their cognition over time. You wanna make sure that there's a quiet environment, you limit distractions so that they're able to focus on what you're saying, you allow adequate time to make the decision and you reevaluate over time um, their level of cognition. You want to solicit their values as well as present the medical evidence. And in this um, situation, you want to make sure you're identifying those cognitive weaknesses and trying to provide support to them. So you can use print tools, right, where you write down these things. I think the, the tool of the best case, worst case scenario where you draw out the diagrams really helps. Um, and employ teach back methods as well as engage care partners with the patient's permission. Just to remind everybody in the audience, these are the relevant GSV standards <laughs> that address these things. And as a summary, uh, patients with cognitive impairment have a range of abilities, so really you want to do a careful assessment of capacity. Um, it's our responsibility to engage the patient in decision making at their level of ability. Um, patients with mild cognitive impairment and dementia can voice preferences about their care, and so you really want to engage the care partner to help support their decision making, but not to, you know, override it. All right. Thank you, everybody. That's my... Thanks very much, Sarah. I have some questions about the year to come, so.
I'm looking forward to questions. <laughs> okay, our next speaker is Elizabeth Wilcock. Elizabeth is um, um, assistant professor at the University of California in San Francisco in the Department of Anesthesia, one of those anesthesiologists who likes to really work with her, They're although like all anesthesiologists. Um, <laughs> and her work is on the long-term and short-term outcomes, uh, cognitive outcomes after surgery, uh, including strategies on how to better incorporate the needs of the patients and caregivers when considering discussion. Very interesting. Thanks. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, here we go. So I'm going to be speaking about long-term cognitive outcomes. And first, let me define, I'm sort of talking about one, two, maybe beyond years after a surgery. There's a lot of concern about long-term cognitive outcomes in older patients who receive major surgery and anesthesia. Articles like this come up every couple of months to years, and I particularly like this one from the Washington Post from a few years ago because it highlights an anecdote um, from Dr. Daniel Cole. Dan Cole is a neuroanesthesiologist at UCLA. He, um, he was past president of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, which is, you know, like the governing body for all 40, 50,000 of us. Dan Cole's dad had an open heart surgery, a cabbage surgery for revascularization, and he was perceived to be cognitively normal before, and after surgery, he returned to 80% of his baseline, and he, in fact, never recovered his full cognition. Um, and if Dan Cole was surprised by the degree of cognitive change that his father experienced after a major surgery, how is it possible that we as anesthesiologists or surgeons or anybody are preparing patients adequately for what plausible cognitive outcomes after surgery might be. Long-term cognitive outcomes are tremendously important to patients, to their families and caregivers. They should be impacting risk and benefit conversations, although there are some barriers to doing that well, um, and ideally impacting post-operative planning so we could give people an idea of what to expect as their cognitive recovery proceeds with their physical recovery. I love this. This is one of the first papers to describe what happens to your brain after surgery, and it is titled, Insanity Following the Use of Anesthetics in Operations. <laughs> so immediately we're blaming anesthesia. This is from 1887, <laughs> obviously. It was from 1887, um, and we've gotten a bit more refined in the years since then. I think this is kind of one of the studies that, to me, brought this into the modern era. This was published in the New England Journal in 2000, 2001 or so, and basically what they did was take a bunch of people who were going to have a cabbage surgery, they tested them at baseline, they then had their cabbage at that red arrow, they then tested them subsequently over time, and really why people freaked out was that this was the five-year cognitive outcome. And these people were experiencing cognitive change um, at way higher levels than a general population control. And when this was covered in the popular media, we got stuff like this from a Manhattan cardiologist who said, if I had a high-functioning 75-year-old, and I'm going to paraphrase here, I would deny him the standard of care for his coronary disease because I'm so worried about these cognitive outcomes. Now, this was an uncontrolled study. There's something missing here. We do not know what these cognitive outcomes might have looked like. Um, and actually, you know what, I'm going to, I forgot about this part. I added this. Um, so I'm going to, I may differentiate between anecdote POCD, and POCD is postoperative cognitive dysfunction. It's sort of the old term for neurocognitive changes after anesthesia that are, uh, surgery and anesthesia that are sustained. Um, Anecdote POCD is something that you notice. You, the patient, you, the family member, this is something that is perceptible. Research POCD has very poor concordance with subjective symptoms of cognitive change. It is purely a research diagnosis. It is neuro neuropsychiatrically testing determined. Um, most patients who have it do not notice any difference. So I may differentiate between those later. And so I went where I was going with that earlier, sorry. Um, it was talking about control groups. So that New England Journal paper, bless it, did not have any control group at all. About 10 years later, there was another study follow-up published to this, and they in fact did use control groups and very, very similar kind of structure here, tested before surgery and then subsequently over 72 months. The heart-healthy controls, shockingly, did better than the people with coronary artery disease. All of these potential um, methods of treatment, whether it was medical management, off-pump or on-pump cabbage, did roughly the same degree of worse, although there's a bunch of uncertainty around those estimates. You can see that. Um, the problem is that if we wanted to know what would have been expected to happen to those patients without surgery, we need even more information. 
Much of these, this work assumes that older adults' rate of cognitive change is homogeneous in late life. They don't establish a cognitive trajectory, a rate of change before a procedure. It's very hard to do operationally. Um, I probably don't need to tell this room that cognitive change, the rate of cognitive change in late life is highly heterogeneous. And a lot of this comes from the dementia literature. As you go through life, you kind of accumulate all of these cognitive risk factors, which are thought to be causal in this review from The Lancet from a couple years ago. Um, so, you know, early life, low education, midlife alcohol consumption, and social isolation and smoking in late life. All of those are hypothesized to add to your rate of cognitive decline in late life. So from this, we know that there are explanatory factors which can show us that people are not going to be declining at the same rate. Further, cognitive change is highly associated with medical events. Cognitive change happens after a stroke. Here's a cute little graph of what um, sort of a simulated event. Um, but not surprisingly, brain is dying. It seems obvious. The thing is that cognitive change also happens after a coronary event. Here's some um, more, again, population-based epidemiologic data where you can establish a trajectory, a rate of change, before an event happens and then after. And then this is really cool ish, not cool. Uh, this is really informative. <laughs> Cognitive change happens after a medical admission. So here's a cool paper where they modeled stroke happening. If nothing happened to you, you're in the purple here. That's looking awesome. But if you have a medical admission, there is a small decrement. It's so small that it's actually kind of covered with the blobby dashes and stuff a small decrement in cognition, equivalent to an additional 1.4 years of cognitive aging after a medical hospitalization. So if you want to know what the causal impact of surgery and anesthesia is, because you're trying to counsel a patient, do I want to undergo a major surgery to fix some sort of functionally impactful or life-threatening problem? You need to be adjusting for aging, because aging is associated with cognitive change. Controls shouldn't be unusually healthy because other diseases are also associated with cognitive change. And controls in the case of heart surgery should have equally serious coronary disease because otherwise you're not comparing apples to apples. Coronary disease is associated with the cerebrovascular disease, which is obviously associated with accelerated cognitive decline. So the only difference ideally would be that control should have no surgery and anesthesia. And there is in fact a cute little model setup that we leveraged comparing cabbage versus percutaneous coronary intervention, which is a very um, clever non-surgical method of revascularizing a blocked coronary artery, or PCI. Um, so in this paper that we published a couple years ago, we asked the question, do major surgery and anesthesia cause cognitive decline? We used data from the Health and Retirement Study, massive, publicly funded, yay, thank you for paying your taxes, um, NIA-sponsored study where every two years throughout late life, older adults get cognitive testing. And in the course of normal aging, things happen to them like cabbages and PCIs. It allowed us to graph stuff out kind of like this, where you see somebody coming into a procedure. You can look at how fast their cognition is changing before the procedure. You can model where exactly in time this happened. And you can look to see if there was an acute change in the rate of cognitive decline before versus after the procedure in one group. And you can even model a control group. And what we hypothesized was that the cabbage group would experience kind of an acute inflection point um, because it is a major maybe trauma thing that happens to your body, and that the PCI group would maybe continue on a similar con cognitive trajectory. So this was published in JAMA a couple years ago. And what we saw was absolutely no difference between the cabbage and PCI groups. There was no difference before. There was no difference after. That's the left panel. That's a cognitive score. On the right panel, that's dementia probability, which was also not different. And I wanted to share to this room that we, as a medical community, are not causing wholesale cognitive harm to older patients by offering clinically indicated surgeries to them. There is not a systematic cognitive hit that we could detect here to a very high degree of precision. Surprisingly to us, um, all of these things were hypothesized to directly cause cognitive change. Surgical trauma, anesthesia, cardiopulmonary bypass pump, postoperative delirium. None of these things summed together were strong enough to see an effect between the cabbage and the PCI groups, even though they would all be expected to be very poorly maldistributed as potential causes of cognitive change. But wait, you say, there is a bit of a wobble where the gold group, the cabbage group, maybe is doing a bit better and a little bit worse afterwards. And I say, I was very fortunate to have pre-specified that we would subgroup out off-pump cabbage. 
Off hope cabbage, you don't get hooked up to a bypass machine. It was hypothesized to be better for your cognition because there's not all these little, you know, pumpy bits pigging up and thrombosis. Sorry, anesthesiologist. Not even a cardiac anesthesiologist. But it was supposed to be, right, pump head. Maybe you've heard that term. That's a whole term for like the cognitive change we thought was caused by the coronary bypass pump. The cognitive decline was essentially only seen in the off pump cabbages. And our best explanation for that was that off-pump cabbage is a clinically inferior revascularization therapy. People have worse ca cardiac outcomes after an off-pump cabbage. It's not as good a surgery. And that, in our hypothesis, is associated perhaps with worse cognitive outcomes long term. So I just told you that Dan Cole's dad shouldn't exist. But, but actually, no. Like, we have to be a little bit more nuanced here. Because looking at population level outcomes doesn't necessarily tell me what's going to happen to the individual patient in front of me. And my mental model of this problem has to include credible, genuine anecdotes like what happened to Dan Cole's dad. So we applied a definition for POCD, um, kind of a very adapted one, to the cohort and found that there were some people who experienced outsized cognitive change compared to where their baseline was. Those people who met our definition for major POCD as a group experienced an additional 25 years of cognitive aging around the time of their surgery as modeled, and it happened in both the cabbage and the PCI groups. So it's not restricted to surgery. It's, it's a medical exposure thing. We compared the two groups on who met these criteria. The people who met criteria for major POCD were on average older. They were much more likely to have had an off-pump cabbage. That was the group that kind of drove that in the surgical group and caused the maldistribution between cabbage and PCI. Um, they were more likely to be frail. They were less likely to have an elevated BMI. Um, and these probably, these factors, I probably identify people who are already on a faster rate of cognitive change. It's hard to know how much would be attributable to the surgery itself versus the methodology that we had to use, which was fairly, which was very well aligned with kind of the old methodology in that New England Journal paper, where we were just basing it on a preoperative measurement and not on a trajectory. So these factors also will scoop people who are on a more rapid rate of decline. Still, um, because of the risk of unrecognized cognitive impairment, which is very, very high preoperatively, um, it's important to identify these people who are likely to have cognitive change afterwards, whether or not it's from the surgery or not, and kind of trying to come up with who it is that's caused by the surgery is like a pie in the sky idea that we're trying to work on. But you can potentially put these together into kind of like a cognitive risk stratification model. Um, we did just because we could, not because this is necessarily clinically useful, but it is possible using epidemiologic data to identify an at-risk population and identify risk factors that may risk stratify you into being higher or lower risk. If we do a cutoff at a 50% risk, um, it's 90, it's, um, here we go, so only like 4% of the people who screened as low risk would have met criteria for major postoperative neurocognitive disorder. Um, if you screen as high risk, there's a much higher chance that you would meet criteria for major or mild postoperative neurocognitive disorder. We can identify who these people might be. It's still not a causal link, but nonetheless, if you were to preoperatively identify them, you could imagine that some proportion of patients would undergo a, a cogn more cognitively friendly pathway, or maybe they would have more detailed preoperative cognitive testing and, and particular attention to delirium prevention and other things that we potentially could do to help and improve the cognitive outcome or at least talk about it ahead of time. Um, so what we can do now, please don't write, avoid hypotension and hypoxia, that's literally my job, um, <laughs> is acknowledge that there is uncertainty in cognitive prognosis, that on average people do well. At an individual level, people may not do well. And we don't have great risk stratification strategies yet to understand who those people will be preoperatively. But it is a real thing. We should still be acknowledging the other anticipated benefits of surgery. What is the patient hoping for out of this? And how does cognitive change fit into that milieu of potentially wanting better function or later, uh, longer life? Many older adults will experience transient decrement in their ability to perform neuropsychiatric tests after a major surgical trauma. Um, that should seem obvious. It's been highly studied. You should, if a patient is concerned, they should expect that um, as they heal. We should all be avoiding deliriogenic medications as much as possible. Um, and one more thing, 
I will say we have done some, um, some qualitative work that shows that we as a medical profession are not doing a good job for patients who experience cognitive change after surgery. Um, I wanted to use this platform to raise awareness that we need to be talking about it in a way that acknowledges that it is a thing, but that we kind of have poor understanding of that thing and how it affects patients. Nonetheless, if we can just add words so that people could talk about postoperative cognitive change in a way that they can bring it to our attention if they're experiencing cognitive symptoms and not feel dismissed by their surgeon or their internist or the anesthesiologist, we usually just sort of disappear into the night. People rarely come to us with these problems. Um, but nonetheless, um, the research definitions we're using require detailed neuropsychiatric testing. That's a problem because it doesn't have clinical extension. There's no pathway how, for how to do this. Neurologists and psychiatrists who understand testing don't understand periap. Anesthesiologists, surgeons, and interns often are not trained on cognitive domains and neuropsychiatric testing. So just knowing the words can be helpful. For those with persistent cognitive complaints, we don't have a unified strategy. Um, it would need to cross disciplines pretty substantially. And even just recognizing that this is a possibility is, I think, a, hope, a help to your patients. Thanks, everybody. Well, a whole lot more questions. <laughs> this is great. OK, our final speaker is um, Dr. Susan McCammon. Um, Dr. McCammon is the Portnor, Portnor, Portnor professor of surgery, of head neck surgery in Birmingham at the University of Alabama. She is a um, head neck surgeon and clinical ethicist and a palliative care a doctor. Um, and she's going to speak to us about, I forget what the third time. Oh, um, the pitfalls, the pitfalls of advanced directives. Great, thank you so much. It's um, a real honor to be here and I've been looking forward to it. Let's see. Okay. Great. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about pearls and pitfalls of advanced directives and contemporary alternatives to assessing patient priorities and desires. I don't have any disclosures. Um, so where am I coming from? So I, I, I kind of wear three hats or a three-cornered hat. I'm a head and neck surgeon. Um, I'm a hospice and palliative medicine physician and a clinical ethics consultant. I try to work in the middle of that Venn diagram. But I spend a lot of my time doing advanced care planning and completing advanced directives as a surgeon, as a palliative care consultant in the high-risk perioperative clinic, and as the clinical ethicist often on nights and weekends where the majority of our consults are about either counseling surrogate decision makers to help with decisions or serving as the surrogate for unrepresented patients. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the terminology that we use. So an advanced directive is really just the patient's wishes expressed in a document. Um, written down, signed by the patient, witnessed by somebody, not the doctor. The location of this usually is in the patient's safe deposit box, so that when you need it, it is not accessible <laughs> by definition. Okay. Um, compare that to um, physician orders for life-sustaining treatment, POLST or MOLST, both terrible sounding <clears throat> acronyms. But these are actually doctor's orders in a document. So signed by the patient, signed by the doctor, doctor um, actually legally binding. So advanced directives are not legally binding. They're legally recognized, but not binding. Uh, the POLST lives on the refrigerator, classically. That's what people are instructed to do so that EMS can find it. Um, now, I wasn't sure if I could show a meme on here, but this, this difference really reminds me of the taco versus tornado meme, right? Okay, so difference between warning and watch. A taco watch is that we have all the ingredients for a taco, but a taco warning is we're having tacos right now. <laughs> so the advanced directive really is just the patient saying, this is what I want, and it depends on the receiving physician on the other end to do those things, whereas the POLST is a two-party document that says, this is what I want, and this is what's going to happen, ideally, right? It doesn't always work that way. So I want to differentiate those two from advanced care planning, which is a much broader spectrum. The goal is to ensure goal-concordant care near the end of life for patients who lack decisional capacity. It tends to be conversations. It includes caregivers and stakeholders documented in the chart, either separately or in a progress notes. And all of these are legitimate sources of information, 
Okay. But the great promise of the advance directive was, was not fulfilled. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the support trial. In the um, end of the 20th century, turning into the 21st century, looking at the promise of just getting people to complete these documents. If we could just get the people to complete the documents, we would be in good shape. And then in 2021, Sean Morrison wrote a pretty controversial editorial basically saying, this doesn't work, okay? Getting the advanced directive doesn't work. The advanced care planning documentation and support trial and several others that he summarized <clears throat> was not associated with influencing any of the medical decision making, did not enhance the likelihood of goal concordant care, did not improve patient or family perceptions of the quality of care, and it did not include improve healthcare utilization. His main point was that it sounds good, common sense says it is good, the data doesn't really support it, and there are big opportunity costs in making big investments in just getting advanced directive com directives completed, and that the presence of an advanced directive can inhibit current discussions about goals of care. So this is pretty spicy, and there were many, many, many responses um, in, the, in the journal uh, with people basically saying, I hear what you're saying, but you know what, I don't care because actually I know that this is important, and even if that trial didn't prove it, I'm gonna still keep doing it, that's necessary but not sufficient, that we have other real-time quality metrics that may be better than simply documenting whether the directive is done or not, um, that doing the process does improve communication, it does improve documentation, decreases caregiver stress, and it prepares patients for the decisions that may come about in the future. So, and most important, these commentators said, was the process, identifying proxies, and having values-based conversations. And I particularly like this graphic from Oleg Kirev um, in New Zealand, looking at the trajectory trajectory of life um, from you know happy, alive, and capacitated to you know lying on your side with double X eyes, uh, showing that you know we expect values to remain stable through life, whereas your health scares and need for preference sensitive decisions increase throughout life. Um, the advanced care planning is really the why, and then the advanced directive health decisions, the actual how, okay? Um, and I would point out that I think one thing that's really important in talking about folks with cognitive impairment or dementia is here, with this assumption that values remain stable through life, and also in the scenario planning um, that informs Gretchen Schwartz's best case, worst case scenario, there's this idea that the person remains stable throughout life, but with mild cognitive impairment and then progression to dementia, that personhood really changes. And so you begin to think about and talk about what it means for your current self to make decisions for your future self and for your current self down here to be satisfied or dissatisfied with decisions made by your former healthy self. Okay, so I'm not gonna dwell a lot on medical decision-making capacity because <clears throat> Dr. Wingfield covered it so well. It, um, it fluctuates, it varies from time to time and situation to situation, it can change. Importantly, I wanna point out that contemporary clinical ethics recognizes the right to patient autonomy even when, and maybe even especially when patients become incapacitated or disabled. And this literature really arises out of disability studies and looks towards preserving the dignity um, and assent processes, processes of patients who can no longer perform consent or even are deemed to be um, lacking medical decision-making capacity. So shared de de decision-making exists along a continuum. We've talked about shared decision-making. Once you start to lose capacity, the more contemporary models of advanced directives and advanced care planning include supported decision-making, where you put the patient at the patient with dementia, that's what that acronym means, as much as possible in the center and the caregivers support as much as needed. But as capacity wanes, you move into needing surrogate decision making. There you have a patient who may not be able to participate and the caregivers make decisions using the ethical standard of substituted judgment, meaning what would your loved one decide if they could fully understand their condition. Um, but patients also, without caregiver or representative, require surrogate decision making, and then you strive as much as you can to use their goals and values, but often you wound up using the best interest standard, and it often reverts to a clinical ethicist like me. In some institutions, it reverts to a committee. Um, occasionally, you have to go to a court-appointed guardian. That is typically not timely or helpful in a perioperative situation. Um, and I'd like to point out that there is a big difference between using a surrogate who doesn't know the patient to 
give permission for non-escalation or a code status of DNAR versus withdrawal or de-escalation of care. Right, I want to turn now to an ethical framework that I think can be helpful in supported decision making and surrogate decision making. As physicians, we are marinated in our entire career and all our board exams in the ethical framework of principalism, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And overemphasizing autonomy can make decision making in this population and completion of advanced directives really challenging. And so I offer an alternative. Um, ethical framework, I hate to even call it alternative because principalism is just so overwhelmingly dominant in our profession, but it is um, really focuses on relationships. It de-emphasizes the need for patient autonomy and the loss of dignity with the loss of autonomy, which is sort of tacit in our minds. It acknowledges the interdependence of people and their support systems. It recognizes that those affected by the consequences of decisions deserve consideration. And that includes logistical factors, where the patient's gonna live, if something happens to make them more dependent, financial considerations, emotional considerations, and then longitudinal considerations about, you know, if we make this decision now, what's going to be the next decision and the next decision and the next decision? Okay, so rather than just doing, you know, a checkbox for we did the advanced directive, sort of the more contemporary idea about advanced care planning is that it's an ongoing conversation to get to goals and values. And instead of having one checkbox, we now have booklets that have lots of checkboxes. And this is just a smattering of, um, of some of the many um, things that we have for serious illness conversation workbooks, training for providers and caregivers. And I'd like to ask how many of you in the audience have actually filled one of these out? with a patient, for yourself. Okay. So I find a lot of people may use them in practice but have never actually filled them out themselves. And there's a big difference between knowing your values, being able to say what your values are, turning those values into goals, and then making decisions based on those goals. And there's often a lot of discordance there. I want to share one that we use in our institution at UAB. This was actually developed during COVID when people were in the hospital alone. It's called Meet My Loved One, and it's just a very simple card in which care caregivers can provide some personal information that helps the bedside providers interact with the patient in a way that recognizes them as an individual person. And this is just an initial step in the kind of conversation that allows us to center the the patient, the person, um, in the discussion about the goals and the values. A fair amount of qualitative research has been done in advanced care planning. Um, this is uh, Jennifer Tia, Tia, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, I think um, roughly out of Boston, looking at the value of advanced care planning in early stage dementia and the barriers to advanced care planning in early stage dementia. Um, the main places they found that it was helpful to clinicians was it helps to ground care in patients' preferences, not caregivers' preferences. So really looking at the heart of substituted judgment. Um, it informs acute medical situations, especially acute care surgery. It informs preferences in the setting of clinician paternalism when we use directive counsel to try to get patients to do what we think that they should do. And just a shout out to the idea that we rarely question patients' capacity when they are doing what we think they should do. Um, and the barriers that they identified were um, just the dynamic changes in medical decision-making capacity. Again, folks who have mild cognitive impairment or dementia um, may still retain capacity. There are different levels of capacity for simple decisions like who do I want my designated surrogate decision-maker to be, who do I trust to make decisions for me versus weighing the pros and cons of different you know, cancer regimens. Um, definitely inconsistent awareness of cognitive impairment by clinicians, um, you know, subjectivity of balancing patient and care partner involvement, and then identifying optimal advanced care timing. People were not sure who was going to do it, when they should do it, where they should do it, and how they were going to get the resources to do it, because it does take time. All right, as promised, I'm going to give you some pearls and pitfalls. So here are some of the pearls. Advanced care planning, including an advanced directive, is better when done earlier uh, and more frequently. Um, in folks that I see, I start this conversation with who's your surrogate in my very first visit, literally my very first visit. We do what we're going to do, and then I say, if you become too sick to talk to me, who am I going to talk to? And then we revisit it at every, at every visit until we get to the point where we can 
you know, really look at a decision, a specific decision that is relevant to the patient, not what do you want to have happen when your heart stops, okay? But if this happens, do you want to have a trach and a peg? Do you want to have them long-term? Are you willing to tolerate them short-term? So specific decisions. Decisions about surgery are an important inflection point when it comes to talking about advanced directives and code status. Um, I know many institutions now have policies in development looking at the perioperative DNR policies. Um, and probably the most agreed upon paradigm is the required reconsideration of whether or not to suspend the DNAR during surgery and in institutions where it is um, where it is preserved through or where it is suspended through surgery, a very explicit discussion about when it will be reinstated. Will it be reinstated the minute you roll out of the operating room? Will it be reinstated when you hit the PACU, the ICU, the third day in the ICU? And that, of course, ties in a lot to surgical buy-in and the Ulysses contract of just exactly what are you agreeing to when you agree to a surgical intervention. Okay, this pearl is really important to me. Any documentation is better than no documentation. Okay, so if you have this conversation, even part of this conversation, put it in your note. Record it as part of that note that gets copy-pasted forward forever and ever and ever. I mean, if there's any good thing, any good thing to come out of the copy-paste function, it is that your goals of care, conversations, even little snippets will be preserved forever in the current note. Um, and I will say that as, as the clinical ethicist, I do go, when I have to act as somebody's surrogate, I go back and I look. And if they don't have an advanced directive, if they don't have a surrogate, or if they have a surrogate who doesn't have any idea, I can go back and I can say, well, look, here in this visit, they talked about this, and this is what was important to them. Okay, acknowledge that there may be discordant wishes. This is important because it's all, not all, you know, daisies. So are we making a decision that they would make if they could understand? Are we making the decision that we think is the right one for them to make? Are we making the decision that feels the best for us as a loved one? It's important to be aware of and resist the golden rule thinking, meaning do unto others as they would do unto you. I've, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this decision because it's what I would want for myself. Okay? When patients look at me and they say, what would you do if it were your mother? I always start my answer with, well, my mother is really different from me and probably really different from you. So first I would say, you know, I would say this is what's unique about my mom and this is how I'm going to make this decision. Okay. Um, Neglect or abuse, surrogates not acting in the patient's best interest at all for nefarious reasons, okay? It's rare, but not never. And actually, I'll take that back. It's not rare at all. It's very common. There are a lot of dysfunctional families in the world, okay? And you as a clinician and me as the ethicist, or me as a clinician and you as the ethicist, we're not going to solve that. And I get many, many calls, many calls from the bedside saying, you've got to intervene. And in the end, it's very rare that it is better to go to a court-appointed guardian. Okay, I already talked a little bit about the current versus future self, present versus former self. That's a whole talk in itself. Um, and pitfalls. Medical decision capacity can fluctuate. It's important to be aware that your advanced directive can be conflated in mind to just a code status, which can feel very threatening. Code status needs to be distinguished between your no code at end of life versus do you want an out of hospital DNAR, meaning you don't want anything done to prolong your life. I talk about this a lot with my cancer patients who are progressing. Again, the accessibility of the advanced directive, often locked up, can't get to it. The role of your medical power of attorney can be limited in your advanced directive, and a lot of people don't realize this. You can say, I want, I want this directive, my wishes to be followed exactly, I don't want my surrogate to be improvising. Or you can say, I understand that my clinical condition may change, and I want my surrogate to have the discretion to make decisions different from what's in my advanced directive. Um, advanced affective forecasting, making decisions about your future self when you may not know what your quality of life will be. Uh, behavioral economics has shown that we are terrible at this. Okay, we are terrible at predicting what we are going to think about our quality of life when we get there. And that leads to what do we do when you have worsening symptoms or quality of life after a decision, any decision, intervention or not. Um, and how do we mitigate decisional regret? Is that something that we could have mitigated upstream if only we'd made this decision better? Or is it really something that has to be mitigated downstream when it happens? Okay, and I will close with highlights. Advanced care planning as conversations over time that build trust, not just a document. 
Start early, revisit often. Any documentation is better than no documentation. It's a continuum from shared decision making to supported to surrogate. And what intervention can we make here? Okay, rather than just the checkbox or the book of checkboxes, caregivers themselves can be prepared and trained for an enhanced consent process to anticipate the decisions that are most likely. The ethics of care is a framework that can work better than principalism for guiding choices for interdependent relationships. Note that cognitive impairment is not the only thing that can strain medical decision-making capacity. Again, a whole nother talk. And finally, medical decisions happen in the context of prognosis, which requires diagnosis. If you don't know a patient has dementia, then you're not gonna be able to accurately prognosticate for them about that or about anything that happens in the context of that. And please remember that hearts and minds can change as a clinical course progresses. In fact, that is probably the most constant in constant. People change their minds and we have to allow for that. Part of the intimidation of signing that, checking that box and signing that legal document is the sense that it's forever and you can't change your mind. Thank you, I'm really honored to be here today and I just a shout out to our Southeastern Institute for Innovation and Palliative and Supportive Care. We have a summit every fall. I hope you all consider coming. Wow, well those were four really spectacular talks. Thank you all so very much.